Hello and good morning to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's program, looking at uh, the China uh, GCC free trade negotiations and the prospects for broader economic collaboration. We have another stellar lineup of experts with us today. I'll introduce them very briefly here and share a link to their full bios with you in the chat. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Rachel Ziemba, founder of uh, Ziemba Insights and an adjunct fellow at the Center for New American Security. She previously served as head of emerging and frontier markets and co-head of research at Robini Global, Global Economics. Her research focuses on the interlinkages between economics, finance, and security issues. I'm also delighted to welcome Dr. Nasser Saidi, the founder and president of Nasser Saidi and Associates. He previously served as the chief economist and head of external relations uh, for the Dubai International Financial Center, the IFC, and executive director of the Haukama Institute for Corporate Governance. He was the minister of economy and trade and minister of industry uh, in Lebanon between 1998 and 2000. Last but not least, I'm happy to welcome Professor Sun De Gang. He is a professor of political science at the Institute of International Studies and the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Fudan University in Shanghai. He previously served as the editor-in-chief of the Asian Journal of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies and a professor and the deputy director of the Middle East Studies Institute at the Shanghai International Studies University. His research interests are Middle Eastern politics, great power strategies in the Middle East, and China's Middle East diplomacy. Moderating the session today is Robert Mugelnecki, senior resident scholar at AGSIW. He created and leads the Next Gen Gulf series examining technology trends in the Gulf Arab states and Looking East, the China Gulf Initiative. And this program today is part of that initiative. He's a specialist in the political economy of the Middle East and North Africa and teaches a graduate level seminar on China, Middle East and North Africa relations at Georgetown University and the George Washington University. And with that, Robert, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, thank you to our speakers and everyone who is joining us today. Uh, it goes without saying that China's role in the Middle East and North Africa, and in particular in the GCC states, has garnered a tremendous degree of attention of late. And this interest has only been accelerated by President Xi's visit in December to Riyadh to the Beijing brokered agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and also the recent news of the Saudi government formalizing its participation in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization um, as a, a dialogue partner. Now, to my mind, the completion of a China GCC free trade agreement would be the next logical step in this uh, broad space. Um, it would, by many accounts, represent a major diplomatic achievement with economic implications. Um, but at the same time, this has been going on for some time now, with negotiations having started in 2004. Um, so I might actually uh, ask the speakers here to humor me um, by engaging in a somewhat dangerous game of prediction about when this might actually come to fruition. But in the case that this FTA takes another 20 years to, uh, to be completed, which I don't think will be the case, we're hedging our bets here and we're going to broaden the discussion into the realm of economic cooperation alongside and beyond the FTA and look specifically at how China and the GCC uh, states are cooperating across a range of areas. So to ask to answer some of these questions, um, I have an excellent roster of speakers. Their bios are, uh, as Raymond said, online, so no need to get into those now. I'm going to jump right over to them and start with Nasser and ask, what are the obstacles that are preventing the completion of this FTA, which has been going on for almost two decades now? And as a second part to the question, what are GCC governments hoping to achieve? What are their primary objectives through this prospective free trade agreement? Over to you, Nasser. It's true. It's been a while since 2004, but circumstances have changed. Um, President Xi's visits to Saudi Arabia is a game changer. It is a historic visit. And you're right to point to the fact that most likely uh, an FTA will result from this visit. We've already seen some geopolitical and geostrategic moves as, for example, the Saudi-Iranian uh, opening uh, 
and which can change strategic relationships across the Gulf. At the time, I think in 2004, the GCC countries were not prepared. They were not diversified. They were immature economies in many ways. So we're talking some 20 years later where they have progressed and they're much more diversified. So now the gains from trade for them, if they go into an FTA with China, are much greater than they would have been back then. Second, whenever you're trading, whenever you're negotiating as a block, it usually takes much longer to negotiate because you've got to have agreement by all the partners, all the countries in the block. And that usually takes more time than simply as a bilateral agreement. So we're now on the verge of an FTA. I will venture <laughs> and make a bet that it's likely to happen, if not in 23, in 24, in 2024. And the fundamental reason, there are some fundamental reasons like I, I'd like to mention. Um, number one, an FTA with China fits into what I call economic diversification 2.0 for the GCC countries. The number one imperative for the GCC is to diversify their economies because they need to create jobs for their young people. Energy, oil and gas is highly capital intensive. It does not create jobs. You need to create them in the non-oil sector. So China is and will become increasingly a strategic partner for the economic diversification of the GCC countries. Second fundamental point, already China is the most important economic and trade partner of the GCC countries. It represents close to 20% of their trade. So already that has doubled since 2010, and they've already gone beyond their trade with the EU and the United States is in third or fourth category. So having a FTA with China um, will solidify the economic relationships, trade and investment relationships. And it's important to note that China is not just a trade partner, it is also an investment partner. It has invested some more than 100 billion into the GCC over the past 10 years, and that is likely to accelerate. So what we're looking at with the FTA is moving away from a transactional relationship, which was mainly energy-based, to a strategic relationship, economic, strategic, and most likely political as well. What are we talking about in terms of diversification? You've got to go into new sectors. Services, technology, electric vehicles, renewable energy is going to be extremely important, climate tech, tourism in general. So what we're talking about is that China will become an integral part of the economic space in the GCC. So you're likely to have a large increase in non-oil trade. I will venture and say that that could triple, that could triple within two to three years. That's a large number we're talking about, but I think the potential is there, particularly if you go to a deep trade agreement, not just a superficial free trade, quote unquote, agreement, but something deeper that goes into regulations, that goes into the relationship between state-owned enterprises and, and other. The FTA, I think, will also be the prelude towards developing payment systems and linking financial markets. Well, there's a lot of talk about the petrol yuan, and perhaps we'll come back to that. But let's also talk about the trade yuan, very simply. But let's look at the economics of it. The GCC and China are major trade partners, but they use foreign currencies, mainly the US dollars, mainly the US dollar for financing the trade. That is inefficient because you're running exchange rate risk, you're running payment risk, and you're running credit risk. Um, it clears through New York. <laughs> and nowadays you have to be careful what banks you're dealing with in the United States. 
So banking risk has increased. It's much more efficient to use the yuan. You can keep the pricing of oil and other major commodities in US dollars, but the clearing and settlement can happen in yuan. You want to link payment systems, and that, I think, will require increasing swap central bank swap agreements. You already have one with the UAE. I think the next one, the agenda, will be a central bank swap agreement with Saudi Arabia. But also, I think you need to go further and link the financial markets. And that's important for the GCC countries because they're in the process of privatizing a lot of state-owned assets and state-owned enterprises. It started with Aramco. It's gone a lot into the energy sector, but also further along. That will open the door for China to participate and help de-risk fossil fuel assets of the GCC. Remember that as the world goes to an energy transition and moves increasingly away towards renewable energy, the demand for fossil fuels will decline. And that poses a risk for the GCC countries that their main source of wealth, their national wealth, is, could become stranded. So they need to de-risk that. They need to list a lot of those assets. And China could be a perfect partner to come in and buy some of those assets. There's also one other item, I think, which is extremely important in thinking of the relationship, namely that governance structures in China and the GCC are very similar. They both rely on free zones and special economic zones, an important role for the state through state-owned enterprises. And finally, in terms of the role of sovereign wealth funds, both have very large sovereign wealth funds. The GCC are sitting on more than $3 trillion worth, and that will increase by another $1 trillion from now to 2025. China has about $1.5 trillion. So when you think of the firepower of the sovereign wealth funds working together to invest in Belt and Road initiatives, or indeed in the Middle East and in China, you're talking about major financial power being put to bear. And the final point I want to make is that with the geostrategic changes, Saudi, Iran, and maybe others, you're going to lead to greater stability in the region and the potential for the reconstruction of countries like Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and others. So what we're talking about is a change in the economic geography of the Middle East. I don't want to exaggerate the importance, but that is what's on the table. If you conclude an FTA and you let it all run with all the different dimensions I mentioned. Uh, Nasser, thanks for putting a lot of interesting points on the table. I know on the investment side and financial instruments, I know Rachel's um, eager to weigh in on that as well. And we'll give her a chance in just a moment. If I could uh, briefly press you or press you to, to briefly give us an idea about what exactly do you see as being um, some of the most complicated parts of the negotiation? I mean, what is presenting the biggest opt obstacles in the holdup? You did mention it is tough to negotiate with a block of countries, and that's a fair point. But if you had to point to one or two key challenges in these negotiations, what would they be? I think it's, it's the lack of experience with policymaking and trade negotiations. Remember that the GCC countries have not been negotiating trade agreements. The last one was, was with Singapore. Okay, The UAE has now gone ahead and now has a CEPA's uh, com Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreements with a number of countries, um, including uh, with Israel, uh, with, now with Turkey, Indonesia, uh, India, in, importantly. So I think the ability to negotiate agreements uh, the capacity, the trade capacity is there. The other one, I think, um, is the issue of what does that mean for relations with the EU and the United States? How will the United States react to a free trade agreement with China? If the US wants to be cooperative, which I hope, then they should try to move ahead with the GCC US free trade agreement and the EU should do as well. 
So I think part of that, part of that reluctance in the past has been that um, you didn't have the, the, the capacity and you didn't know how other countries would react. But I think the fundamental reason is that you didn't really have developed economic sectors. What do you have to trade with China except for oil? Now that you've diversified your economy, you can now trade, you can now negotiate. Otherwise, there was precious little you could negotiate with. So I think your ability now to negotiate is there. You now have a vibrant and dynamic private sector as well in, in the GCC, and you have more to put on the table, which was not the case back in 2004. So back in 2004, it was very limited and you didn't have the capacity to do so. Now you do. Great. Thank you. Let me um, switch the direction of this conversation and the analysis um, and move over to Dagong. Uh, Dagong, <clears throat> what to your mind is, the, is Beijing's primary objective behind this FTA? What are officials who are involved in negotiations looking to accomplish? And I will also ask you to um, to comment on an area you've published extensively on. What does this FTA reveal about the nature of Chinese economic diplomacy in the region? Thank you so much, Robert. And I would like to thank HSSIW to organize such a great event. Uh, when I would like to put them together, I think that by 2022, China has signed 19 FTAs with 26 countries. And the, the three most important ones are RCEP in Asia Pacific, the China-Europe Comprehensive Investment Agreement in Europe, and the third one is, of course, China GCC uh, FTA. China has both economic and political objectives for, for FTA with GCC. Economically, the logic behind it is China can get economic reward from the FTA. Uh, so we know that China's BRI is towards the West. GCC is looking East. GCC represents 30% of oil reserve and 20% of natural gas. And China GCC summit last year uh, designated five areas of key cooperation of energy, finance, science, technology, outer space, and culture. We know that China has exceeded the European Union to become the largest trading partner of GCC in 2021 and 2022. And China's GCC trade volume reached 250 billion US dollars, while China Arab trade volume is 350 billion US dollars, representing two thirds of the whole trading volume with Arab countries. Saudi Arabia alone has uh, China-Saudi trade volume is 95 billion US dollars, while Iran, China, Iran trade volume is only 15.8 billion US dollars. From this, therefore, from the economic perspective, GCC is very important. We know that China's Sinopec signed a 27 years agreement with Qatari, Qatari counterpart, and uh, Qatar will provide 4 million tons of a liquid uh, LNG for China every year. So China has established RMB Clearing Center in Qatar and UAE, and Shanghai Petroleum and Natural Gas Exchange Center was, est was established for RMB settlement for the future petrol RMB, right? This is for the economic reason. The second one is the political objective. We know that in the background of great power, competition and rivalries, the GCC countries are very important. Just uh, we know that the last week, uh, the second summit for democracy was held, but no China or GCC countries were invited. So they have shared the same identities as the global rest. China and the GCC countries are uh, regarded as authoritarian, non-Western, and they regard human rights as their internal affairs, they uh, highlight sovereignty. Therefore, they believe that modernizations have different forms. China and GCC have their own ways of, of modernization. So within this geopolitical background, China GCC 
free FTA has geopolitical implication, especially in 5G, AI, solar energy, nuclear energy, and the digital economy, etc. China would like to encourage GCC countries to seek strategic autonomy, not to economic, uh, uh, politicize or securitize economic ties. So China regards GCC as geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, influence in the in the 21st century. So, so I believe that with that in mind, China will speed up FTA uh, negotiation with, with uh, GCC counterparts because from the geopolitical calculation, it has very important implication for the internationalization of RMB and for, for the greater in, uh, influence of the European, uh, Euro-Asian countries, including China and GCC. So, as you mentioned, China's economic diplomacy in the Middle East, I think China would like to invite Western, uh, West Asian countries to join the greater Asian community. Because from the Chinese pers perspective, the Western Asia is part of Asia, greater Asia, not Middle East. So with the improvement of China GCC FTA process, I believe the G uh, GCC countries will be invited to join BRI for a greater Asian community. Maybe you can say it's imagine the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let me also just do one quick follow on. Do you share Nasser's timeline in terms of the an FTA potentially emerging either in 2023 or in 2024? Does that resonate with you, seem accurate, or do you think it might take longer? Thank you so much. Uh, uh, the FTA negotiation is like a marathon. It's almost 20 years, right? And the most uh, uh, the challenging part is that if we have FTA, Saudi Arabia and other countries will have the upper hand because they have very strong petro, uh, petrochemical industries. They will flood into China and it will cause very heavy unemployment. According to some inside stories, if we sign FTA with GCC countries, it means maybe 50% of Chinese petro Chemical, uh, petrochemical industries will, will, bank, will be bankrupt in China. It will cause tens of thousands of unemployment inside China. Therefore, in the last 20 years, Chinese government was very cautious because it will be economically not rewarding. However, in the 21st century, in the current great power rivalry backdrop, maybe the political calculation will be predominant. I believe that China, China and GCC countries will speed up negotiation for FTA because Chinese have this kind of uh, concern that is GCC is under negotiation with UK, European Union, South Korea and India for FTA as well. And uh, GCC has already uh, signed FTA with Singapore, right, in 2013. So, U.S. has also become the FTA partners with Bahrain and Oman. Therefore, China has this kind of uh, urgency to speed up FTA, albeit it's very hard for China to make a final decision. Thank you. Thanks. The, I'm glad you brought in the petrochemical dimension because, I mean, in, in doing research on this on these negotiations, that pops up again and again as being one of the major obstacles. Um, I wonder, and I, I will ask, I'll turn this question over to, to Rachel as well as part of a broader uh, question for her in her opening remarks, but maybe last word to you, Dagong. I mean, you, do you see the petrochemicals um, issue posing a potential, is there potential for compromise on that issue, or is it going to be one that, as you potentially indicated, the political um, gains outweigh what, what you know, potentially losses on the petrochemical side of, of, of the negotiations. Is there a way to bridge that gap or is it just going to be other areas and other potential rewards from this FTA and pushing it through will potentially overshadow um, some of the losses that Chinese companies and firms might, um, you know, might, might suffer as a result of that? Thank you, Robert. Actually, Chinese petrochemical industries are not competitive as that of Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries. But I think they can find a middle ground for a compromise. Maybe Chinese service sectors can open the market 
in the upstream or lower stream lines of, of uh, GCC countries as a kind of compensation, right, as a reward. I think China and GCC countries on the basis of win-win can find a middle ground and the both sides need FTA to promote economic interdependence because China is strong in market, technology, and manufacturing industries, while GCC countries have very uh, abundant resources. They are very, very complementary to each other. Therefore, I think they can speed up. Maybe next year, 2024, is the 20th anniversary for the, uh, for the FTA negotiation. That could be potentially a timeline for, for the two sides to reach agreement. Thank you. Can I just interject? Can I just interject just to build on that? Um, that there is an alternative, namely renewable energy. China, of course, is a leader in renewable energy, solar, wind, and the rest. And that is precisely an area the GCC countries or the two major economies, UAE and Saudi, want to go into. So here you have a strategic partnership in terms of a renewable energy. And so anybody who gets displaced in petrochemicals can move into renewable energy uh, in, in China. Second, I think the Saudis are building a 300,000 barrel, projecting a 300,000 barrel plant um, in, in, in China, right, the refinery. So th there are alternatives to, the, to those potential losses. Excellent. Thank Can I add one? Yes. yes. Can I add one? One more and then we'll, yes. one more and then we'll, yeah, move, we'll move over to Rachel. Go ahead. Be short. Yes, I think uh, the compromise could be China will provide new technology for the new clean energy for the GCC countries. Instead, they will, uh, the GCC will have some compromise on petrochemical industries. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much for your patience here. Um, I'd like, uh, I'd like to ask you about the broader investment related considerations underlying this perspective, China GCC FTA. Uh, where do you see room for more investment collaboration between the two sides? And how would, the, uh, how would an FTA fit into that equation? Also, if you'd like to weigh in um, on the petrochemical side of things too, that would be appreciated. Over to you. Great. Actually, I think I might start I might start there in the great debate that's opened up. And I'm so glad that we're talking about petrochemicals, both because it's sort of so important. And it's been really a stumbling block, not only in this FTA, but also I think more generally in other FTAs that the GCC has tried to sort of sign, right? Um, you know, Nasser and others sort of highlighted the sort of issues with with UK, with with Europe. There, there are other issues as well here, but but petrochemicals as kind of especially over sort of the past being the, an area of kind of secondary and tertiary sort of value add production that the GCC was was um, involved in as opposed to primary energy has really kind of been that that, that sort of sticking point. Um, yeah, and you know, I just reiterate, you know, Nasser's point that it's of course interesting and been important to see Saudi Arabia in particular invest in refining and petrochemicals in China that, that both I think highlights maybe uh, it's, it's not necessarily a way of, of easing the blow necessarily the FTA, but it's also something that an economic relationship that went on despite the fact that there was not a formal FTA, but that there has been such commitment to greater economic relationships, right? And that's something that, you know, and, and, and we can debate and, and I may, you know, sort of hedge your timeline, Robert, but I think what, what is clear is whether or not there's an FTA um, in the very near future, there will be more kind of economic economic relationships announced um, and maybe a sort of narrower. My sense is if it's something broad and comprehensive that we're talking about, it probably takes us a little bit later into sort of this decade than necessarily in the next sort of 12 months. But we could see some sort of narrower deal um, and, and side deals. On the petrochemical issue, per se, one option to ease this is there could be a phase-in period. Right, we've seen that not specifically in in um, uh, the in sort of GCC FTAs and negotiations, but in other countries' trade agreements, notably in Europe and the like. And and I'm not it's not a conversation I've had, but there could well be a phase in period of of time there. Um, but yes, ultimately, I think there is a bit. There's historically been a bit of a chicken and egg problem 
with the GCC China um, FTA um, and, and some others, which is that until that, that generally GCC exports have been goods um, that in general have petrochemicals, petrochemicals aside, they've generally been goods that have limited tariffs in, in China, right? Primary energy and, and the like. Um, and you really see that when you look at the bilateral trade uh, relationship or, or the GCC export side of the relationship. And, you know, you really see on the on the Chinese side very much electronics, both capital and consumer. And so one of the challenges, this chicken and egg, has been that developing other industries locally in the GCC requires subsidies, requires incentives, requires redirection, and that if anything, there might be more of a push to protect some of those industries, which could make reducing tariffs a trickier thing. Um, we've also seen a dynamic that as GCC countries um, have moved away from uh, they've tried to diversify their revenue streams. If anything, we've not only seen a move to VAT, um, but we've also seen in some countries, including Saudi Arabia, a move towards marginally hiking uh, customs sort of tariffs. Um, and so I think politically there are some challenges there. That's all, that's not to say that the FTA can't happen. Um, and some of those adjustments reflected changes to align with other GCC countries. Some of it uh, was adjustment to the common tariffs. Um, but it just reinforces, I think, a point we've all highlighted that the FTA itself um, would be sort of maybe less important than investment and in financial and other aspects that could go along with it. Now, when we look at the economic literature, there's mixed stories of how much uh, free trade agreements lead to investment. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they're very specific stories, right, um, in, in sectors. But ultimately, I think here, um, the, the political symbol of, of an FTA, particularly if it also starts to grapple with some non-tariff barriers, which I would argue are, are more problematic than the tariffs per se, um, because multi, most favored nation status tariffs are, are not that high. Um, and th those would be sort of more, more significant. I mean, I think, just, so just to kind of put this out in a more broader global context, um, and reinforce some points my fellow panelists have sort of made here. I think it's important to note that these discussions are coming at a time when obviously nothing is happening at an actual multilateral level on trade. Um, and we've seen two different things happen globally, right? We've seen a recourse to more bilateral agreements and many lateral agreements, particularly in Asia. Um, we have compete, competing and maybe overlapping uh, CPTPP by, led by uh, developed economies, but with some emerging market counterparts. And we also have RCEP that China is a major mover of. And one thing I guess I would be watching for is not only implementation and the like of deals like RCEP, but whether moves towards a GCC China um, uh, FTA also provide um, more scope for um, market access and other discussions with other Asian countries. Um, you know, I'm not trying to get us too far ahead of our of our boots, um, but that dynamic. The other trend we are seeing is narrower agreements based on sectors. And while we have seen in GCC countries in China sectoral and and targeted sort of agreements for some time, co-investment strategies. Uh, we're seeing that more from developed economies right now. Think of this sort of very narrow trade deal that has sort of come in place um, uh, or coming in place perhaps between the U.S. and Japan on electric vehicles. I think it will be interesting to sort of see um, in this sort of broader geopolitical context, in a context where, if anything, uh, many countries don't want to reduce their trade barriers, um, sort of where sort of where this fits in and how far it goes. Um, but but back to sort of just to conclude these, these opening remarks to your broader question about about investment, I think we have continued to see joint investment of some of the strategic funds. Um, that's maybe been slow between GCC countries and China. Arguably, that's been slowed down a little bit, both by the pandemic uh, 
as it made it more difficult to sort of do joint deals around the world, not just a, a regional story, but also by some of the structural changes underway within China's funds, uh, particularly the um, consolidation of, of CIC and, and other entities um, that, that, that could change. But what is notable to me, of course, is that until now, we've mostly seen those co-investments in the extractive industries, in these sort of core areas, and whether or not businesses, and particularly maybe slightly more arm's length, slightly less state-driven businesses getting involved would depend not only on the FTA, but also on, on other policies to incentivize. Um, I'm going to stop there because uh, I can't wait to hear what the other panelists have to have to say. Well, don't stop just yet because I asked everyone a follow on question. So you're going to get right. one too. Uh, you narrowed the scope down into looking at agreements over particular industries. Nasser mentioned earlier, uh, SEPA is the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreements. And that's just one example of, of bilateral free trade uh, agreement like uh, ag you know negotiations and initiatives. Do you see these types of activities as ultimately conflicting with and distracting from the completion of a China GCC FTA? Or is this, you know, is it something that can potentially enhance the negotiations or is it just, you know, are these activities going to happen anyway and we have to bake them into our assumptions? Um, you know, there, these are these are activities that are happening at different levels and we just have to account for them one way or the other. Curious how you make sense of these, you know, the, these different types of activities and the challenges and opportunities that it might provide for the kind of the, the topic of today's discussion, the broader FTA. Yep. So, you know, that's that's always uh, always a question, right? Just as you have the question of um, it, maybe it was more asked at a time when there was a chance of something happening at WTO level or the like, of, you know, uh, bi bilateral versus, you know, sort of regional and, and the like. Um, yeah. I tend to think if you carve out the area where there's the most mutual interest, then the broader deal might not get done. But then again, the broader deal might not get done anyways, right? So, um, you know, it's a, again, it's one of those sort of, you know, one doesn't know. I think the political impetus and, and indeed economic impetus, but especially the sort of political interest in, of uh, China in particular, I think, to continue to sort of send a message out to the global community of support of trade. Um, you know, we can question, I mean, some of that's narrative, a lot of that is narrative. Um, but I think there's an incentive to, to continue to work in this area. And I think both and the GCC countries, of course, have an interest in expanding these relationships. But I guess my view is that um, I think ultimately we're probably going to see more of these um, sort of targeted, you know, sort of targeted um, investment and, and other opportunities, the sort of financial linkages um, that doesn't mean they might not be packaged as an FTA. Um, but I guess there's an element where as I look at traditional FTAs, I can look at it and say that um, just sort of something that focuses more narrowly on sort of tariff reduction, the, the net benefits might be sort of less than, than revealed, and that's where it becomes about these side deals. So I don't necessarily see uh, side deals as, 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 as an obstacle, um, particularly as you might sort of phase in other areas. Now, one counterpoint, I think, to, to something perhaps Nasser mentioned at the start um, that I think we should sort of highlight and sort of potential potential benefits, particularly in the near term, is just to highlight that there's a long stream of countries that have looked and said, well, China is a very big domestic market and, you know, we're sort of now producing goods we can sell there. Some of those have been successful, but a lot of those have, have struggled. So it's not to say that there aren't benefits from greater economic cooperation, particularly on um, renewable energy and clean tech. Um, technology transfer in a variety of areas. Um, but just to say that even as China's moving up sort of the value chain and moving up sort of the wealth chain, um, there's also been a big push to deepen its own uh, you know, chains in, in technology and the like. And there's a number of areas where, um, you know, sort of GCC might not be that competitive. So targeting and making sure of what are the areas that are, are really um, attractive uh, will be, be important. And, and I think we can unpack that over the discussion.
But can I bring in can I bring in an element we we haven't we haven't mentioned, um, namely something about global value chains. Um, UAE and Saudi and the GCC in general are reasonably well integrated into global value chains. That is not the case for the rest of the Middle East countries. So one very important aspect of a China GCC FTA will mean there will be spillover effects and trade creation effects for the other Middle East countries that are increasingly integrated with the GCC. So what you're looking at is not just trade benefits for the GCC, but also for other countries. You take a country like Egypt, you take a number of other countries which are now getting increasingly integrated with the GCC because of one particular aspect, namely the large investments that the GCC countries have done in trade facilitation, in transport and logistics, linking a lot of countries. You take a country like India, it doesn't have the port infrastructure or the transport infrastructure that the UAE has. As a result of that, there's a lot of re-export trade that, happen, that comes from the UAE into India as a result of that. So one of the things that's going to happen, I think, is that there's going to be a lot of re-export trade that will grow uh, from the UAE and Saudi into surrounding countries. That will take Saudi into Africa. Um, they're already thinking, and there are plans to develop a Red Sea Council uh, by, by Saudi to develop the Red Sea area. Um, UAE's orientation is also towards the greater region. So what's happening is what I call regionalized globalization. And China, China can be a very important partner in that regionalized globalization. So to build on what Rachel was mentioning and what the gang was mentioning, you also want to look at some new technologies. So for example, um, Saudi has always been looking at the automotive industry. It has a population of over 30 million. So it can be marginal as a producer, but now that you've got electric vehicles, ah, then they can become competitive by partnering with China. And indeed, there's a Chinese company, Innovate, uh, which is now going to be building electric vehicles in Saudi Arabia. So what you're talking about is new industries, high tech, electric vehicles, AI, uh, all of that I think is going to be on the agenda. Whether you want to strike a, a, a deal which is sector specific, I don't think it's in the interest of the GCC. What you want is a strategic partner that's going to help you to go into economic diversification across a broad set of, of sectors. And the main difference I would submit, for example, with, with the EU and the US, is that China has been willing to invest in the GCC countries and the Middle East countries, something that we haven't seen from the EU or indeed from the US. So for example, when the EU opened up the, the, the Euromed agreements, uh, it ended up just being opening up consumption markets for EU industry in the Mediterranean countries. Whereas what we have seen is China has been willing to invest and therefore add to economic development and be a factory economic development. So I think some, from a GCC perspective, that's what they're looking at. They're not looking towards just side deals. They can get those at any time. Thanks. Yeah, the I mean, it's, it's a really important point on the regional spillovers. We know that the UAE already enjoys a pretty healthy share of the region's re-export activity. But at the same time, Saudi Arabia is, is certainly trying to carve out for itself a much larger slice of that um, re-export trade. And I guess to the degree that that activity then there's a positive spillover to other GCC states and even other Middle East and North African states um, will, will certainly depend on how much progress there is on the regional economic integration front, which we have been hearing about for some time. And I think uh, to your point, there are some some positive indicators, um, better activity, um, whether it's rail or uh, maritime shipping routes, ports and the like, um, but certainly uh, also a lot of work to be done and a long way to go to really get that regional economic um, uh, integration up to uh, to its full potential. Um, maybe at this point, I'll pivot a little bit because all three uh, of you mentioned uh, financial linkages. 
and uh, and also various financial instruments and platforms uh, that could uh, enhance collaboration. Now, we know um, that a number of Chinese officials have been calling for, um, you know, a greater use of, uh, of, of Beijing's currency um, in a number of different activities and transactions, especially uh, in terms of energy trade. Um, Nasser has written about uh, prospects for a petro uh, yuan as well. You know what we have seen is some indication from uh, regional officials, you know, hinting that they would be inclined to support those types of initiatives, but not necessarily an extremely eager and immediate embrace. Uh, so I guess the the question to all three of you, maybe we'll start with the gong and then make our way around uh, Rachel, and then and then and then uh, end with Nasser. Um, what do you see as the um, main finan financial instruments and platforms that are currently uh, in place to facilitate collaboration? And where could those move to in the future? I mean, what's the next level, um, the equivalent to the economic diversification 2.0, the kind of uh, financial infrastructure 2.0 that we could see emerging over the next couple of years either within a free trade agreement or alongside a free trade agreement. So, um, Dagong, over to you first. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, petrol yuan is a long-term process. In the foreseeable future, it's very hard. That is, I, uh, RMB cannot replace uh, uh, petrol dollars in the foreseeable future. There are two reasons. The first one is RMB is not convertible internationally. It's a hard one. The second one is China GCC trade volume is very imbalanced. That is, GCC countries will have a huge number of RMB in trade. Therefore, they don't know how to use it. If there's a trade imbalance, uh, over, you know, you know, over uh, RMB will be a hard problem for them. So maybe uh, it will be done step by step. China would like to promote our internationalization of RMB and transactions with yuan, but it will be conducted step by step. Petro uh, yuan is not feasible in the short term. Thank you. Sure, I, I, I would I would agree that petro yuan is is a slower um, a sort of a, a long term trajectory. Um, I think the other issue is ultimately, I think this the sort of expansion of, of sort of use of the renminbi in the GCC depends on China's comfort level with internationalization more generally, which is, I think, what Degung was sort of getting at, um, underpinning it. And there's been this tension for some time of, on the one hand, wanting to use it further. On the other hand, the implications on capital controls, the implications um, of, of sort of also access to other assets. There's another broader issue um, when we think about not just using it from a trade perspective, and I know NASA will sort of come into this in some more detail, but is that China and the GCC are both surplus regions. And that the sort of that, you know, while there's a lot of more renminbi denominated assets, including uh, debt at all levels, um, there are limitations of, 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 of per, per foreigners of purchasing those debts. There's also elements where from a global balance of payments perspective, um, to the extent that there is more uh, one surplus country demanding the assets of another surplus country, not only would the currency values go up a lot, um, but you would sort of end up with then someone else, maybe even China, needing to turn around and buy more U.S. dollar assets. So, so from a global balancing savings perspective, um, the, the, the economics are not, are not necessarily there. But we are operating in an environment because of the US weaponization of the dollar, and I would say the G7 weaponization of their currencies, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but also other countries where many more countries are saying, let's start to experiment. Let's use, let's sort of work with bilateral trade. Let's work with different ways of um, hedging uh, commodity exports. We saw this sort of first um, uh, yuan denominated LNG trade. I mean, and of course it's just the first, but I think this is an environment where countries that a few years ago would just sort of throw out, maybe we should do more bilateral trade in our local currencies. They're really trying to see what that would look like. And that goes to Nasser's point of, um, you know, sort of needing, of 
some entities needing to be several steps removed from uh, specific US banks. But I do think we're in an environment where there is a lot more experimentation and that countries and entities that feel they are more at risk of sanctions are going to have that push. Now, I think um, in, the G in the GCC context and hopefully even in China, that immediate push is, is probably not going to sort of lead to a flood. Um, but I do think we'll start to see measures that make it a bit easier for companies to say issue in in in, in other currencies and, and and the like now but but robert i know your question was brought was a broader kind of financial perspective it wasn't only renmin be denominated or the like but but i do think it's linked so one of the other interesting question marks are also relating to moves away and experimentation on uh, global benchmarks of key commodities right there's been a lot of attempt to add liquidity to um, gc based benchmarks that until recently wasn't going anywhere, but now seems to be, um, at least to an extent. Um, Chinese commodity exchanges really trying to sort of increase in that area. One thing I'm watching for is, especially in the LNG space that has really struggled to get the right price discovery because just pegging it off of an oil price <laughs> doesn't really sort of fit the circumstances that we're in. Um, pegging it uh, with respect to coal <laughs> doesn't really work either. Um, but sort of I'm watching to see if um, large buyers start to hedge in that way. So looking at co sort of joint efforts to get to better price discovery, um, I am interested in whether there might be um, co more sizable co-investment, you know, sort of allocations of capital uh, from, say, regional sovereign funds to sort of assist other parts of local balance sheets to um, to list on on public markets. Um, that's something you know that that depends a lot on local and global liquidity conditions. If it works, um, we are probably heading into a period where local liquidity conditions, especially in the GCC, might be relatively more robust, but at a global level, the sort of debt service costs, the impact of um, it, sort of the, the impact of the rising interest rates um, suggest to me uh, this is this is going to be a challenging environment for um, getting these items off, off the balance sheet. Um, so that may be more of a medium term story. Um, and then I also just think so so we may see, you know, sort of in that way. Um, and then I, I just wanted to clarify, and, and I didn't mean to um, mistake there to say that just sectoral agreements were, were good and would be good enough. I was just saying that the that they might happen anyways, um, the push would be greater and that there would be um, a political and economic push to at least announce some things along the way. I could be wrong. They might hold out. But those kind of things are, are are some of the things that we're so that, that I'd be watching for. I think one challenge, as I think about as we think about the financial channels, some of those in my mind, given the challenge of the GCC to coordinate amongst itself, I think that's more likely to be bilateral than sort of at a regional level. But we'll see how the competition comes to play. Uh, Nasser, over to you on uh, yeah. your thoughts about the Petro One and, and or and any of the other broader points that Rachel just mentioned as sure. well. So maybe let, let's let's recap a little bit and let's agree on on where we are. I think what we would all agree on is that there's going to be a phased move towards a Petro Yuan or what I prefer to call a trade yuan. Okay. Um, you're going to need more opening up of the capital markets, both in the GCC as well as in China. To Rachel's point, these are both surplus countries. <laughs> they all have to export. They're exporting their capital. They're trying to invest it. If you look at the period um, over the past 15, 20 years, it is the GCC countries and China that have been financing budget deficits and fiscal deficits in the United States. And the United States has been borrowing like mad. That result of that is that GCC and China are sitting a lot of liquid assets in US dollars and in treasury bills. Now, as Rachel rightly pointed out, the United States has increasingly been weaponized, weaponizing the US dollar. 
And we've seen that come to the fore recently um, with the Russian-Ukraine war. Now, the message to China, as well as to the GCC, is that if I don't like your politics, I could weaponize my dollar and I could potentially freeze your assets and I could potentially impose sanctions. And we've also had heard noises from the EU that they could be wanting to confiscate Russian assets or at least use the proceeds of investment from Russian assets to finance the reconstruction of Ukraine. That issue of potential confiscation goes against the whole idea that the West, quote unquote, stands for the rule of law and everything that we've been building in terms of liberalization for the past 30, 40 years. So there's a danger there that with what's happening in, in Europe, that the message comes to China and the, U and, and the GCC that you have to start thinking of protecting your assets. So I, I put that on the table because I think there is, there is that message out there. So how is it that you, can, that you can proceed? The first way is you say, I want to use the yuan for financing a lot of trade with China. Part of that is the oil trade, but there's also a lot of non-oil trade that happens with China. And you don't need to um, use the yuan as a reserve asset. All you're talking about is using the yuan for clearing a settlement of trade transactions. We've had that in the case of an, L an LNG transaction recently. But on net, what you're really saying is that if I'm running a net trade surplus with China or vice versa, that can get settled in a internationally convertible currency like the US dollar or the Euro or, or others. So what you do is that the bulk of the transaction gets financed cleared and settled using the yuan, and any net gets settled in a, a convertible international currency. But over time, I think what we need to think of is a scenario whereby the GCC countries need to are saying to the rest of the world, we're going to be opening up our markets. That's happened already with the DAO, it's happening in the GCC markets. And the message really says is, if you want our capital, come and list here, come and use our, our markets for listing. And I think one interesting area uh, is renewable energy. Um, at the moment, there is no renewable energy hub finance hub in the world. There's, not, there's none in, in London, not in the US, not in Zurich, not anywhere else. So the potential is for the GCC countries to become the hub for financing renewable energy globally. And let me put that in a wider context of saying, what we're seeing is a new global energy map, yeah, which, which has been developing. Russian oil and gas has now been going towards China, India, Pakistan, and, and others. So a lot, of the, a lot of those flows are now going to, towards Asia, along with oil and gas from this part of the world. But the next step is renewable energy. The GCC countries have a comparative advantage in producing renewable energy through solar power and wind. That can translate into exporting electricity, right, into Europe through cables and lines. You don't need to export your oil, your, your oil and gas and as well cables into India and other countries which are now importing uh, oil and gas. So what you do is you convert your oil and gas capacity um, into renewable energy capacity. And for that, you, I think you need a partner and the Russia, I mean, China would be the perfect partner for that. So what we're talking about is greater opening of Chinese markets, you start off with an offshore renminbi or the offshore yuan first. A lot of investment can take place there. And then the GCC countries can open up their markets and attract more Chinese capital to come into their markets for investment in the GCC themselves, as well into the greater GCC, GCC area. So phasing, 
whereby you start using the yuan for a lot of trade finance, and eventually it becomes the more traditional uh, financing of portfolio flows and capital flows. But what we're talking about is a transition over maybe 5, 10, 15 years, nothing, nothing that needs to be imminent. Um, so that's a scenario I think we, we can discuss. It's a really good segue, actually, to one of the, the questions from, from our audience, which I'll turn to now. Um, we were asked, you know, in, in an FTA, how do you see climate and clean technology uh, factoring into the ultimate agreement? So this gets to a little bit of what you were, you were saying, uh, Nasser, at the end of your, uh, of, of your answer there. And how consequential will emissions reductions as a goal be in, in the final FTA negotiations? I wonder, are, when we think about other global examples of FTAs, is there, uh, are there any models or, or, or useful case studies where these issues, climate-related uh, concerns, clean technologies, have been folded into uh, into FTAs, and how might that be done in in this particular case? Uh, maybe Rachel, uh, I see you nodding there. Would you like to to kick things off? So, so I think we need to unpack two two pieces here, right? Because I think we can talk about and 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 Nasser has highlighted in really great sort of detail this this sort of idea. But so I think we can highlight and spot out the um, clean energy technology, the production, which of course, to some extent is like any other kind of good um, and, and indeed service that could be covered. Um, and so I think in some ways, there's a lot of uh, FTAs out there in the world that were not really focusing on these components. And if anything, there have been tariff, you know, sort of you think about developed country tariffs that sparked up, particularly in the US, to block Chinese solar panels. There's also, um, and that's it's an anti FTA sort of measures. Um, so, so, so there's the piece on the items, the components, the, the whole supply chains. Of, of clean energy. And then there are environmental regulations and guidance that also sometimes are sort of there alongside FTAs and sometimes are, um, you know, some of it's a dynamic as I think we've alluded to that, that, that often in setting services and guidelines and, and principles, um, com countries will align them to something that has bite. So historically, before the U.S. and other countries used sanctions at the drop of a hat, um, as tra trade agreements were sort of the things that had bite and sort of compliance. And so there was a lot of questions about labor and environmental measures. And I'll note that even this morning, I was reading news that the, the even longer standing discussions between the EU and Mercosur over a free trade agreement are faltering over environmental sub side deals. Um, so I, I doubt there would be a sort of environmental sub deal per se um, around committing to climate targets or the like on, on a China GCC FTA um, for a variety of reasons. Um, they would be seeing um, any of the issues in this sector as, as helping meet their targets, but there wouldn't be something like a side deal on stopping deforestation, which is what's holding up, as I say, the EU-Mercosur deal, um, among other things that suggest that that deal is um, more, more complicated. Um, so, so I, you know, that dynamic, and then of course, the, both the renegotiation of NAFTA um, and the NAFTA is sort of per se, um, and, and even what I think the U.S. is trying to do with the IPEF in the Indo-Pacific involves a shift towards principles and rules relating to environmental standards uh, and the like. As I say, that second piece is probably less relevant for our discussions uh, or discussions here. Um, and that there's been an element in other FTAs to maybe sort of update and upgrade and think about these supply and value chains that really weren't a factor 10 years ago, 20 years ago when some of these FTAs um, were done. But I do think there's a, probably an interesting question about the creativity about um, what are the tools needed to um, incentivize uh, technology transfer, to incentivize innovation that is even more uh, sort of suited to the climactic and other conditions uh, in the GCC and in the broader MENA region. Um, and those could be sideline deals to sort of an FTA. Yeah. No, sir. Mean, maybe quickly, yep. quickly, Robert, just, just to quickly to, to answer your question. So far, I don't think we've seen FTAs include climate-related uh, conditions. I think 
the next generation of trade agreements, free trade agreements and others will probably venture into climate change. Um, we've seen, for example, the EU wanting to impose carbon taxes and carbon uh, uh, border control, uh, border control taxations. I think you'll, you'll probably see more of that. Um, but these are still very, very early days. To come back to the GCC, I think, and China, um, you have a natural partnership because both of them have large carbon footprints. Both of them have an incentive and China has been heavily investing. It is by far the largest investor in clean energy and renewable technology in the world, by far passing the, the EU and, and the US. So both the GCC and China have a, a strong incentive to invest heavily into renewable, okay? And particularly solar. So I think what you're going to have, what I see in, in the future is a natural alliance be between the two of going into renewable energy technology, particularly solar, but also wind and, and other. Carbon capture is another one. Let me mention two other technologies, which I think this part of the world uh, can be exporting, which are climate tech. Um, one of them is desalination. 80% um, of the water that we use in, in this part of the world uh, comes from outside the region. 50% of the desalination capacity of the world is in the GCC. And they've been using that for the, third, for the past 30, 40 years. This is a, a exportable technology to the rest of the world, which is living water stress. So I think this is an area where China and the GCC can work together. The other one, and perhaps surprisingly, is district cooling. Um, most of the world has these air conditioning units that you, which you have hanging out of apartments and, and, and offices. That is highly inefficient. What the GCC have done, particularly UAE and, and Saudi, is that they've developed new areas. And in order to do so, they've gone through district cooling. So you have a cooling plant which serves a whole district. That again is an export technology. So I think as you move forward, um, those two, the GCC and China, I think will be at the forefront in terms of renewable energy and will be major investors in, in renewable energy and will drop many of the barriers between them to let that industry grow very fast and climate tech in particular. Thanks, Dugong. I'll give you the chance here, the last word on this subject. Where do you see climate related considerations, renewable technologies factoring into either these ongoing FTA negotiations or just kind of ongoing and broader economic collaboration between China and, and GCC states? Thank you. I think uh, NASA is right. In China, GCC, FTA, green energy, clean energy is not the focal point. Actually, China was, is offering solar energy and nuclear energy technology to GCC countries. But the, in negotiation, this one is not a conflicting point. Maybe another one is very important one is railway systems. I think we should notice that China is a manufacturing uh, factory world, uh, world factory and uh, in railway systems, China is very strong. And I think Mohammed uh, Salaman, MBS, raised the, such a question about the continental railway from the Red Sea to the Gulf. This is what has got positive response from China. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move now to, I'm gonna pick up on two questions from uh, from the audience. Uh, both, so two different attendees have asked about uh, free trade agreement related implications for uh, for tourism on the one hand, and also for Islamic finance. I think these are these are two really interesting questions. Um, on the one hand, with tourism, we know that almost all of the countries in the GCC, maybe with the exception of Kuwait, do have pretty healthy and robust, uh, and to varying degrees, uh, significant tourism industries, uh, whether they're well established like the UAE or they're kind of niche, uh, they have niche offerings like in Oman or in Saudi Arabia, which is maybe at an earlier stage but beyond uh, established religious tourism, of course, but has you know major, uh, major ambitions in on the tourism front. That's an important question. So how do you see a potential FTA um, 
factoring into this uh, tourism equation, especially as COVID-related constriction uh, restrictions end and uh, Chinese tourists and visitors are able to kind of come back into the global supply in a way that they haven't been in the past couple of years. On the Islamic finance front, I can say that I, my students and I at Georgetown, we, we read articles about you know Hong Kong, for example, being a Islamic um, finance hub. This is from years ago, prospects for uh, for Hong Kong being a hub for Islamic finance and a gateway to uh, you know to China in that respect. So I'm curious to what degree um, you can pick up on either of those or both. Um, but I think it's important to look uh, beyond some of the the uh, the most obvious sectors, energy and the like, to to some of these other areas of collaboration. So maybe we start with uh, with Nasser first, and go to Rachel and um, Dagong. Sure. Um, on the tourism front, um, it's important to note, just to take one number, uh, prior to COVID, uh, back in 2017, you had over 1 million visitors coming to the UAE. That's substantial. I mean, that, that, that's about more than 10% of the tourism, of the tourists coming into the area. Now that China has opened up again, um, and the fact that the UAE um, has been classified, and this is important, as an uh, allowed area, as a, as a, what's the term? Anyway, uh, an admissible area for tourists. In other words, they are protected, et cetera. Um, you'll see, I think, a increased flow now coming back in. Saudi is opening up very quickly. And I think you've got three types of tourism. You've got the religious tourism, which we know, You've got cultural tourism, okay? And you've got increasingly environmental tourism coming into, coming into Saudi. And Saudi is looking at that as a major area. So I think services in general and tourism in particular, um, and therefore visa agreements will be part of, of any FTA. Uh, already the UAE um, is providing long-term visas, uh, tourism visas are available online. Saudi is going the same direction, Oman is going in the same direction. So I think this part of the world um, is going to be a major tourist, tourist attraction. And on top of that, I think um, we're talking about maybe long-term tourism turning into long-term residencies, uh, we, which we've seen already. And again, they have every incentive to try to attract people with the skills and knowledge, again, as part of diversification. On Islamic, um, I think it's a different, it's a different area. Um, there was a lot of interest um, across the world and also in Hong Kong to develop Islamic finance, sukuk, um, and a lot of similar instruments in order to attract capital from this part of the world. I think there's less interest today than there was maybe five or 10 years ago. However, I will mention one area namely that Islamic sukuk and Islamic finance is particularly environmental finance friendly. So very friendly towards sustainable finance because the ethical principles underlying sukuks and similar Islamic finance instruments apply very well and transit very well into sustainable energy and sustainable finance. So I think you might have a revival of that interest and I could easily see the listing of sukuks, particularly in the UAE and Saudi, being attractive to inflows to go into those sukuk, and vice versa, having trading with Shanghai and Hong Kong. I think part of the FTA is going to be looking at how do I link the Hong Kong market and Shanghai market through a connect to the UAE markets and to the Dawal in Saudi Arabia. I think that's certainly on the cards. There has been some initial discussion. So I think you'll see more of that along with potentially a linkage of payment systems through Hong Kong. And Hong Kong has a distinct advantage because it already does real-time gross settlements of dollars, euro, uh, pound, and Swissy. Uh, in real time, as well as the yuan. So linking uh, UAE and Saudi with the Hong Kong market and the Shanghai market can happen through the payment system in Hong Kong. 
So I think that is very much on the cards. Rachel, would you like to pick up on either tourism or the Islamic finance thread? Yeah, so I think in both cases, we're talking about areas that might benefit from the broader deepening economic relationship and the focus and the government focus on on these relationships. Um, I mean, I think, and, and it's possible that gets folded into an FTA. It's possible that's just sort of part of the, the general focus. Um, uh, again, I, I think there are certain sort of policy moves that were done um, on the GCC side in, in the moving out of the pandemic that, that, that make this a bit easier. I think if anything, I might be watching for other services to be sort of more folded into FTA or later phases, which maybe are a little bit tougher to do than, than, than tourism, right? I mean, that might not be in the initial phase. Um, not all FTAs cover services as well as goods or might cover some. There are lots of non-tariff barriers and services, but I guess that's where I might be watching as well for um, common, you know, sort of areas um, around, you know, mutual recognition of even different service providers. So something to watch. That's, that might be a, a, another follow-up FTA, but but something to watch there. Um, yeah, I would I would tend to agree on the um, Islamic finance side that it that might not be folded in, you know, sort of per se, um, and if anything. Um, uh, yeah, so so I don't think I have anything to add to what Nasser, you know, sort of hi highlighted there. But ultimately, I think where tourism is concerned is other policies that aren't necessarily a part of the FTA, um, including even uh, Chinese policy choices about facilitating um, outbound sort of outbound visas, not only being a preferred destination, but also just even the speed of exiting, th those are going to be, um, th those are going to be quite, uh, quite important. And then, of course, once you start having tourism flows, a number of other, there are other service flows that uh, materialize. But ultimately, I think this is a good example of our broader sort of discussion, which is to say that the way the FTA is being conceptualized is, is, is not sort of a narrow FTA that the benefits will depend on exactly what's incorporated. And it's why I think it's an important thing um, for all of us to kind of keep tracking exactly what's been sort of agreed to, what the different things are, what the different phases are. Maybe I'm talking my book, our books, right? Um, but you sort of so often out there in the sort of in the press, there's a discussion of, oh, there's an FTA. And, and what does that really mean? And I think here trying to combine together the set of different policies that are done, whether it's under the overarching umbrella of the FDA, or whether it's just um, pulling together other things that have been announced, those are going to be important things for us to match the sort of, you know, what's announcement effect and, and what's announcement, what's actually being facilitated, and, and what's going to be short-term versus medium or long-term impacts. Gong, over to you. Yes. Uh for FTA uh, in terms of tourism, I think China, China and GCC countries are promoting people to people exchanges. Therefore, tourism will be very, very important one. And uh, the problem is the visa with visa free uh, policies, if it's implemented, uh, the huge number of Chinese will of course flood into GCC countries. Before COVID-19 every year, 100 million Chinese people will travel abroad as tourists. So that the number will be huge for GCC countries as well. For Islamic finance, I, I'm afraid the Chinese counterparts in the banking system have very little knowledge about it. What is Islamic finance? Maybe they have no idea about it. Therefore, it's not in the foreseeable future a huge area of cooperation. Thank you. Okay, uh, great. What I'm going to do in the last 10 minutes of, of this discussion is take some inspiration from the very ambitious economic policymaking in Saudi Arabia and try to uh, bite off three to four questions. So um, I will mention one and uh, and give my brief uh, response to that question and then pose uh, one question to each of the speakers and would ask if you could just try your best to about two to three minutes. I think that will leave us, um, bring us right about to the end of our allotted time. So. Um, and, and and allow us to get through most of the questions here. Um, the first one asks, the first question has to do with, does this FTA with China signal a shift in the GCC region's foreign policy, which was historically 
uh, inclined uh, toward the U.S. and its allies. Uh, of course, feel free to answer um, these questions uh, in brief, uh, in addition to the ones I posed to you. But I, I would be willing to say that no, I don't think so. Um, as we discussed, this FTA has been in the works for some time. It's been happening alongside a number of different uh, shifts and critical junctures in the GCC's foreign policy, and, and maybe more accurately, um, GCC member states' governments' foreign policies. We could look toward the COVID-induced econ economic downturn um, and uh, a number of other um, regional issues as well that maybe were uh, more important kind of foreign policy um, you know, uh, influencers, so to speak, than, than the FTA. But of course, I think it's an important point to bring up because it is going to, to have an impact and the FTA, whenever it emerges, is going to emerge within a particular context that um, that is painted in, in one way or, or the other by um, the region's foreign policy stance. So I think um, I'll leave that one there. For the first question, we had, an, by the same audience member, another question about um, debt and debt in instruments. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put this one to Rachel. Are there concerns among uh, regional leadership, I guess GCC leaders, about a uh, quote-unquote debt trap? Um, maybe... You know, I think traps probably, in at least within respect to the GCC, uh, certainly are exaggerated. We don't see uh, these countries probably uh, being at risk for unsustainable um, debt or predatory lending. But are there any other concerns on the debt side of the equation about um, potential uh, vulnerabilities or um, or other concerns related to debt that um, that we should keep in mind? Sorry. No problem. <laughs> My apologies. I wasn't sure if you're going to run through all of them. Um, so on the debt side, um, look, I mean, I think always uh, important to focus on whether investment so, uh, sort of the uh, sort of what the debt's being taken out for, or whether there's sort of the return on capital. I would imagine that there are more concerns about the debt and debt sustainability in um, non-GCC regional players that the GCC has a, has a role in, right? We've already talked about the potential for this economic partnership between the GCC and China. Does it spill over? Who are the, the beneficiaries? Um, we have seen um, the GCC both, you know, sort of expand and somewhat contract in its sort of financial support to countries like Egypt and uh, countries in the Horn of Africa, um, involvement sometimes of the IMF and not the IMF. Um, I, I, th I think that that's a broader kind of element of maybe common interests. Um, you know, Nasser, I think, also brought up to say that, you know, if some of the broader other set, maybe this connects to our your, your question you answered, Robert, um, if, if some of the other broader moves in the regional geopolitics lead to stability and lead to a space where we can think about reconstruction, I would be worried about some of the debt sustainability in those locations. Um, but I think here the question mark is probably more one of, I mean, the more realistic debt worries would just be a um, how attractive the investments are. So it might not be a coming into a big um, debt unsustainable um, dynamic. It's not a sort of the kind of debt trap that the Americans wander on the world warning about Chinese predatory lending. Um, but getting in the sort of foreign capital to sort of co-invest with the local capital, the expertise, as always, um, you know, sort of what's the return really going to be and to, and, and to, and to whom. Um, and then I guess there's also going to be an element that's relevant, not specifically in this FTA, um, but of uh, what's the return, what's the uh, overarching, um, you know, sort of what's the overarching exposure um, from sort of local, say, interest rate sensitive sensitive sectors, and that, that is something to watch, and that will then play into how attractive these entities are if they're being listed on local exchanges or global exchanges and this whole sort of question here. So not the FTA per se, but yes, always um, debt and financing have to be have to be a factor. Thank you. Uh the question for the gong, um, one of our listeners got the sense from your presentation about investment decisions 
um, involving uh, kind of state uh, state related considerations. And they ask, does that mean that Chinese capital will continue to flow to the Middle East even during times of downward uh, business cycles? I guess maybe I'd add to that. I mean, if you could give a flavor uh, for for our listeners about state business relations and how the state business relations impact investment decisions in the Middle East, I think that that would be very helpful for for our audience. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, eighty percent of China's investments in the Middle East go to goes to GCC countries and Israel and Egypt, not other places. Uh, in terms of investment, in, you see China's state-owned enterprises will be guided by Chinese government. Therefore, they will invest in the areas suggested by Chinese government. However, for other, you know, uh, private companies, they prefer to take risks. For example, in Iraq or in other unstable countries, it means opportun business opportunities. So we have a tendency to believe that Chinese companies will invest in the stable countries. That's mostly done by state-owned enterprises. For Chinese, you know, uh, private enterprises, they may take some risks in the unstable areas. Thank you. All right, and finally to to Nasser, one of the uh, one of the attendees picked up on a point of that I guess you that you covered on on FDI, and I don't recall the exact. But they put out this number of $100 billion of, of Chinese FDI to the region. The number stuck out in my mind because Saudi Arabia has uh, plans in place to, to try to increase annual FDI up to $100 billion by 2030. So it also jumped on my radar for another reason. Um, and of course, if, if, if countries like Saudi Arabia are to reach those very ambitious levels of FDI, uh, I think it's safe to say that some of the source destinations where the sources of FDI will, will come from place uh, from firms and investors in China. I guess maybe could you just pick up on on sure. maybe dig a little bit deeper into the Chinese FDI story in the region and, and where you see um, where you see that going in the future. Thank you. Yeah. So so the number I mentioned uh, was for the period from 2010 to about 2018. Yeah, uh, a lot of big decline during COVID. Uh, as the gang was mentioning, a lot of it went into energy. Yeah and to a lesser extent into real estate. And of course, it went into the two most, the biggest countries, um, Saudi and the UAE, with Saudi getting the bulk of it, UAE, and then to a lesser extent, other countries in the region. Now, uh, the reason why the number does not appear very large, and it isn't very large, is because there were restrictions on inward flows and on FDI. So you could not invest in real estate. It's only recently that uh, it's been opening up. Saudi is now announcing that they're going to allow uh, foreigners to own, to own real estate. But primarily, much of the investment could only take place in special economic zones and free zones where you had liberalized access. Okay, That is now behind us. So if I look forward, now that you have much more liberal policies in terms of FDI, I think that will accelerate. And then you've got a number of mega projects uh, which we know about, particularly in Saudi Arabia, NEOM and others. And the clear strategy and intention in Saudi Arabia is that, including also for investment into startups and startup industries, is precisely to attract foreign investment into those areas. So the state will come in, provide seed money, attract private investment, and attract international investment into, into those industries. Um, the question about the debt trap um, is not relevant for the GCC countries. Uh, they're, they're net capital exporters. They have relatively low levels of debt. They have sound finances. And remember one important point, they diversified their sources of public finance by introducing VAT and, and other taxes. So the fiscal situation has become much more sustainable than it was a long time ago where they were highly dependent on trade taxes. So now, for example, in the context of an FTA, they can drop those trade taxes, tariffs, and, and others uh, without any impact really on their fiscal sustainability. On your final comment, I think we, you mentioned um, this issue, is there a shift in foreign policy? I don't see that, that shift in foreign policy. What I do see is increased disengagement by the GCC countries from regional conflicts. 
they want to go back to economic development and to develop their countries and help develop other countries in the region. So you've seen them disengage from the Palestine-Israel. They've now opening relations with Turkey again, Iran. Uh, they want to be able to stabilize Yemen and maybe help rebuild it. So what you're moving towards, I think, is um, geo greater geographic, geostrategic stability and using China as an agent, if you wish, uh, for want of a better word, able to talk to all the countries in the region at a time at which maybe um, the United States and Europe don't have that ability to dialogue with other countries in the region, say, uh, and Iran. So uh, Chinese diplomacy has been able to uh, open up areas that were previously um, difficult to, to negotiate. So I think what you're entering um, is a, also a new geostrategic map for the region. Thank you very much. It gives us a lot to think about and, and much more to discuss in future events here at the Institute. Uh, we are just a minute over, so I will bring this to a close, but not before thanking Rachel, Dagong, uh, Nasser um, for, for your really informative insights here. Um, thank you for all of those who stayed uh, to the very end here and to listen with us, and we look forward to welcoming you to another event soon.